We're allowing things in this nation right now. We're allowing things in our country right now that God destroyed other countries for. And I don't know how much longer he'll give us. I really don't. There were Christians in them other countries, he's, he's, them other civilizations that don't even exist anymore, you realize? So I don't know how long God, God will give us. I really don't. I'm burdened about it. I'm very burdened about it. And I don't know what to, to do but to pray and call on God and try to influence those around me to turn to the Lord. That's all I know to do. Amen. It's not that I'm... <clears throat> It's not that I'm so patriotic that I forget we're living for another kingdom. We're living for another country. This is not ours, really. This is just where our bodies are dwelling. But while we're here, we're, the whole point of this nation is freedom. Freedom to worship God. Our forefathers, and I'm not trying to get political on you, but I just feel like saying all this this morning. It's on my heart, so I'm going to get it off. Our nation was founded by people who left a place where they were oppressed and under tyranny to come to a place and God allowed this. God provided this. God made it happen that those men and women sailed to this country to find a place where they could worship him freely. And God blessed that society. And out of that society came more missionaries that's ever been sent than anywhere else in the world. This country has been a beacon for the gospel light to shine for so, so long. But now this country has turned on God who brought her. And now God is going to have to judge this country in order to bring her back to either anywhere close to being what she was or to judge her and destroy her. That's the only two courses I see taking place. So in, in, in light of that, I urge you, I beg you, pray for your nation. Pray for your, pray for your state, pray for your county, pray for your town, pray for your street. Amen. And above all, pray for your home. Amen. All right. We're going to get into Matthew chapter 12 this morning, and we're in, what is this, part what, 48? Yep. Part 48 of getting to know Jesus. And uh, <coughs> Jesus, if, if you've been <coughs> paying attention how we've been doing this, you remember Jesus was in the marketplace, uh, I mean, or he was talking to the Pharisees, he called them out, he called out the cities of, of uh, Chorazin and Bethsaida, and then he and then he called out the Pharisees, or he called them out first, and then he called out those cities. But uh, he called them out because they would not understand that he was who he said he was. They wouldn't believe on him. And because of that, he told them that they were going to be judged. He told those cities it would be a whole lot more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for you. Listen, it's, Jesus told us that it will be more tolerable for some in hell than it will be others. He has been laying it to them. I mean laying it to them and, and just straight up telling them how it's going to be. And then we and then we see last week we saw this sinful woman after Jesus gets invited to this dinner party and they're all there in this man's house. This man brought Jesus in there. He called him in there just so he could trap him in his words, try to trick him up and, and, and uh, trip him up and catch him in his words and say, aha, see there, you're not who you said you were. I've shown you to be a phony. He was hoping he could prove Jesus to be a phony. And when Jesus came in, he was laying there on the floor, eating with this, with this man and his friends who was around that circle. As they're reclining there on the floor, Jesus on his elbows propped up, and all the rest of them too. And a woman comes in behind who was a known uh, lady of the evening, prostitute, whatever you want to call her. Uh, she come in, she had obviously been saved beforehand, and she's standing behind Jesus, and she's weeping, and she's weeping so hard, her tears are falling down one after another on his feet, and his feet, which were dirty from having walked about in sandals, and uh, so tears are just falling on her on his feet, and I'm sure you can see where the tears are running through the dust that's on his feet, and she bends down, and she begins to wipe his feet with her hairs, drying his feet, with her hairs, and she's kissing his feet, and this man's watching all this happen, and Jesus hadn't even paid any attention to it. He hasn't referred to her at all, and of course the man said, look, this guy knew, if he were a prophet, he'd know what woman this was. He'd know what kind of a person she was, and he wouldn't let her do this for nothing in the world. And, and Jesus said, you know what, I got something I want to say to you, and he said, well, what is it? Say on. 
And so Jesus basically told him, said, listen, so there was a man, a man who had loaned some money to two fellas, and one of them, one of them owed him quite a bit. I mean, he owed him quite a bit. And this other man owed him a whole lot less, about a tenth of what the other man owed. And he just gladly forgave them both. He said, which one do you think is going to love him more? And Simon the Pharisee said, well, the one that, that owed him the most. And he said, you've rightly judged. He, and it's funny because Simon thought he was going to get Jesus and trip him up and catch him in something. And Jesus flipped, as they say, flipped the script on him. And he put him in the shoes that he meant to put Jesus in and showed him very plainly, listen, if you, the reason why she's doing this is because she used to be a great, and I have forgiven her, and this is her love that comes out of somebody when they're truly forgiven. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So when somebody gets saved, a real change takes place in them. It's not just giving lip service to God and saying, oh, yeah, and, 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 and don't misunderstand me when I say this, but people say, well, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. It's like, well, if I've got to take somebody, I'll accept him. That's not the way it should be worded. I believed on Christ. I put my faith in Christ. It's not, well, I just accepted him. No, I, 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 I knew he was my only option. I knew he was all, the only hope I had. So I put my faith in him. I'm trusting him. Let's don't put it in those other terms. She had put her faith in him. She had given her all to him. And that's why she brought the most expensive thing she had, which was her fine perfume that she wore when she was when she was in her profession before. The most expensive thing she had. The very thing she lured men with before. She brought and poured out over his feet as an offering, saying, Jesus, I don't need this anymore. I'm through with that life. I'm giving this to you. Amen. What a great picture that was last week. Let's get into this week. Amen. All right. So after that takes place, there's a couple little odds and ends happen that I'm not going to go into because we couldn't just really, really just didn't have time to build a message out of it. Let's go on to verse 22 of Matthew chapter 12. And this is right after that took place. Right after that took place. And the Bible says there in verse 22, and we're going to read 22 through 37. And then we're going to go back and we're going to look through it and see what all God shows us out of it. Amen. Y'all pray for me this morning. Don't really have an outline as such. There's just so much in here. I just didn't see any point in building an outline. It'll preach itself. Verse 22, chapter 12, the Bible says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men, and whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good, and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt, and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, 
How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account of in the, thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words shalt thou be justified, and by thy words shalt thou be Thou shalt be condemned, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before your throne this morning. Lord God, we need you. We pray, Lord, that you meet with us today. Father, I pray that you would, Lord, you'd guard my mouth, and Lord, you'd not allow me to say anything I ought not to say. Lord, that you'd, you'd bring forth from my mouth the things that are pleasing to your ears, Father. I pray, Lord, that you'll allow me, Father, to speak something this morning that might make a difference in someone's life. I pray, Father, for those who are listening to us this morning, over the Internet, Father, I pray, Lord, for those who will listen later. Father, I pray that, that Lord, you bless their hearts. Lord, you speak to them. Lord, you do a work in their lives today. Father God, we need to meet with you, Father. We, we, we think we're so self-sufficient in this world. We realize, Lord, we don't realize how weak we are. We don't realize how needy we are. Lord, we don't realize every moment how much we need to hold your hand. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, help us to get to know you. Help us to know how much we need you. Help us to feel our need of you. And God, I pray this morning, I pray you'd open our eyes spiritually. I pray you'd, Lord, give us clear vision of where we're at in this world, Father. I pray, Lord, you'd give us an understanding of how, how near the time is, Lord. And I pray we'd, we'd awake, Lord. We'd, 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 we'd awake and begin to, to live for you like never before. I pray, Lord, for these things, and I ask it in Jesus' name, and I ask it for his sake and for his power. Lord, may the Holy Ghost rest on me as I preach today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. So much to say. So much to cover. I don't know how we'll do it all. And if we don't do it all, that's okay. We'll get back on it next week. But I want us to get right into it. Verse 22. The Bible says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil. One possessed with a devil. That sounds spooky, don't it? You know there's people possessed with devils all around us all the time. We live in a world with people possessed by devils. We, we picture, see the problem is we have this picture in our mind of what somebody possessed with a devil is going to look like. We picture them going, Bleh! look like the Tasmanian devil on a cartoon. Okay? Oh, somebody can't control themselves just laying there foaming at the mouth possessed with the devil. Folks, that's not exactly what that looks like. A devil, a devil is, is happy to keep somebody looking normal as long as the, on the inside they want nothing to do with the Savior. That devil is, is happy to just confuse somebody. Maybe they're not, maybe they're not always uh, seeming to be possessed with a devil. Maybe sometimes they seem absolutely normal. It's only when they're challenged spiritually that that devil manifests itself. There's all kinds of ways that a devil can possess somebody. I'm not here to talk about devil possession this morning, but I want you to understand that this is not unusual. It's not unusual at all. And the Bible says they've... Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil. Well, you know why he was brought to him? Because he couldn't see him. He was blind and dumb. He couldn't speak either. So the windows of his soul were closed off. He'd never seen Jesus Christ, and if he heard something, he couldn't talk. So nobody knew anything about this man except that he had been blind and he had been dumb where he couldn't talk his whole life. He's in a mess, wouldn't you say? I mean, how would you ever know anything about him? I mean, he couldn't even speak. But you know what happened? Somebody saw him and they said, you know what? Jesus can fix that. Do you see that? The Bible says, then was brought unto him. So and the Bible doesn't, you know what? God doesn't see fit in this instance. God didn't see fit right here to mention these men. You remember, there's another place over in Mark, I believe it's chapter 2 or 4, I can't remember off the top of my head, where the four men picked up their friend who had the palsy, was laying on his bed, and they brought him up on the rooftop, and they tore a hole in, they dropped him down to Jesus. Here was another, here was another instance where somebody took pity on somebody else, had compassion, and said, if we get him to Jesus, Jesus can straighten this out. Folks, let this be an, let this be an example to us, first and foremost. Why we are here. There is one reason why you are still here. You ever thought about it? Why, 
have you ever asked God this? How come when I got saved, I couldn't just go straight to heaven and be with you? You ever thought about that? It kind of makes sense. Hey, we get saved, we're, we, we wash clean from sin, well, let's just go to a place where there's no sin. But God put us here. He left us here. There's a reason why we are here on this earth. There's a reason why when God saves us, he puts his spirit within us. There's a reason why the Holy Ghost of God lives inside each and every believer. And that is because you have to have God's power to do anything for God. Do you realize that Jesus Christ, when he walked upon this earth, he humbled himself as a man. He did everything that he did in the strength and power of that same Holy Ghost who lives inside each and every believer. Do you hear what I'm saying? The same power that did the things through Jesus Christ on this earth does that same work through you and I. Then how come we're not doing anything? How come you and I seem weak and helpless? Can I, can I make a suggestion? Maybe, just maybe, we are, we are not exhibiting the faith in God's power to do some things that ought to be done. Maybe, just maybe, we look around and see all the darkness of this world and all of the evil of this world, and we just kind of go, ooh, I don't know if I can do it. I, don't, I just want to just keep myself clean and stay out of the way of all this stuff and not bother anybody. Maybe that's kind of how we look at things. If I can take care of me and I can take care of mine, then, then, then we'll be safe, and that's kind of how we look at things. God wants us to step out on faith and look and see somebody who needs him. See somebody who really needs him. And go to them and take them to Jesus. Amen? That's why you are still on this earth. Do you hear me? Did you hear that? That's why God's got you here, because there are people out here who are still lost, still in sin, still their lives are full of devils, and they don't know how to get to heaven. They don't know how to come to Jesus. They don't even know that they need Jesus. Have you ever thought about why we call people who don't know Jesus lost people? Why we call them lost? Do you know why? Because they don't know where to go. They don't know the way out. They have no idea where to turn. They are lost. We say they're in dark. The Bible says they're in darkness. Do you know what that means? That means they can't see. Just like this man. He couldn't see. He couldn't see Jesus. He didn't know where Jesus was. He didn't know who Jesus was. Somebody else had to have compassion on him. Do you know that somebody had compassion on you? Do you realize somebody was praying for your soul? Do you realize somebody looked at you and said, they need Jesus? In my case, I can tell you there was a lot of people. In my case, I remember my Sunday school teacher, Miss Shirley Simpson, she used to look at me. I was a little boy like Cash sitting over there, and she looked at me and said, he needs Jesus. And that's why every Sunday before the bell would ring and we'd go into big church, every Sunday she'd set us boys along that wall and she would go through the gospel and tell us about how we needed Jesus to take our sins away. Every Sunday she'd do that. And it embedded into my heart and mind. And when sin presented itself so clearly to me in my life that I saw it and I realized, hey, I'm sinning against God, the Holy Ghost of God showed me that. But you see, others were praying for God to show me. Praying for God to get through to me. These people saw this man and they said, the only one that can get through to him, because he can't see and he can't speak, the only one that can get through to him is Jesus. The only one who can do anything about this is Jesus. All right? And the Bible says, they brought him, one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him. In so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. 
Can you imagine that? Here he is, and he can't. I mean, he don't. He don't know a whole lot of what's going on. All of a sudden, boom! His eyes are open, and he sees everything for the first time. It's kind of how it is when you get saved. I know that's kind of a metaphor for that, but that's kind of what happens when you get saved. Amen. As soon as you get saved, you're not the same as you were before. You don't. You don't see things the same because now God has moved in. God has brought to life your spirit. You're able to talk to God, and God's able to speak to you. And all of a sudden now you have something different that you never had before. You have a relationship with the Almighty God. I mean, look here. Satan was on the throne in this man's life. You've got to understand that. This man was possessed with that. Possessed. That means to have control of. Satan had control of this man. And when Christ got a hold of him, guess what? Satan got knocked off the throne. And Jesus sat on the throne of his heart. And this man was changed. He wasn't, he wasn't the same. This didn't, this, this didn't phase Jesus. Jesus has all power. You understand that? All power. Jesus said it. He said, all power is delivered unto me in heaven and in earth. There's nowhere he's, where he doesn't have all power. i got to hurry up. I won't ever get done here. Amen. I sat there this morning saying, I don't know how this will ever make a whole sermon, but it's going to take more than one or two, I think. All right. But he both spake and saw, and all the people were amazed, and they said, Is not this the son of David? Now, that may not seem like very much importance to you, but you've got to understand what they were saying. You remember when John sent those two disciples to ask him, Are you the Messiah, or should we look for another? And Jesus was healing all those people and doing the very same things he did right here. <clears throat> and he said, you tell him that, the, that the, deaf, the deaf hear, the blind see, and the, deaf, and the dead are raised. You tell him. You know what he was saying? Here's the qualifications for the Messiah. Ain't nobody else ever been able to do this. I'm him. That's what he was telling John's disciples to go back and tell him. And here they are. And they look at this man who was deaf. And, I mean, he was, he was blind and dumb. And all of a sudden now he can see, and all of a sudden now he can speak. And they look at this and they go, Is this the Messiah? Is this him? Surely this is him. Nobody else has ever been able to do this. And they're be- I mean, the crowd is, their, their spiritual eyes are starting to come open all around. People are, the, the Spirit of God's at work, and they're, they're beginning to respond to it. And the devil didn't like it. See, the devil just lost the battle. The devil just got knocked off the throne in that man's life. And now all of a sudden the devil begins, he's losing his crowd, you see. And when the, and as soon as that happened, the Pharisees piped up. Because you see, they were the religious men of the day, but they were devils themselves. The, the religion that does not embrace this book, the religion that does not hold Jesus Christ and his salvation through his blood, up to the, the very forefront of everything that they do is out of the pit of hell, and so were these men. Though they claimed to speak for God, they were wicked as the devil on the inside. <clears throat> but when the Pharisees heard it, oh, they began to hear them ask, is this him? Is this really the one? They said, this fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, above the prince of devils. I tell you how he's doing all this. The devil's doing it through him. That's what they were saying. This Jesus you think is the Messiah, he's a devil. That's what they were saying. Now you think, put yourself in that. Can you imagine? Do you see how hard the devil wants to fight against what God's doing? Here's an example right there. The devil jumped up and said, hold on everything. Wait a minute. He's trying to sell everything. Look, don't, don't mistake this. Don't think for one second that the devil is fooled. The devil knows exactly who Jesus is. There was never a question in his mind. Amen? The Bible tells us that the devils believe and tremble. Listen, anytime Jesus faced off with the devil, they were begging him, please don't do nothing. Don't send us away before the time. Oh, don't, please don't do anything to us. I mean, they, they're scared of Jesus. He whooped the devil. When he died on the cross of Calvary, somebody put it on a T-shirt and said, Jesus beat the devil with a big ugly stick. The cross of Calvary. 
Amen? He did. I'm listening. The devil's a loser. I know it looks like to us. If we look at it our world, we look at it our nation, we look at it our schools, we look at our government, we look everywhere around us, we look at the culture, and we say the devil is winning everywhere. Don't you think for one second he's going to be victorious? Oh, he's going to destroy a lot in his path. But don't think for one second he's ever going to win. God's just given him enough rope to hang himself with. It's all been planned out beforehand. So they said to Jesus, or they said to the crowd, listen, don't be fooled. This man, he does it. He's, he, his power comes from the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation or ruin. That's what that word means. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then, how shall then his kingdom stand? Now, I don't want to miss verse 25. Now you listen to this. Every kingdom divided against itself shall be brought to desolation or ruin. <laughs> Folks, listen to me just a second. Can you not see what's happening in America? The force of evil is at work in our nation right now. The force of evil is trying to pit black against white, Republican versus Democrat, liberal versus conservative, North versus South, husband versus wife, children versus parents. There is nothing but division created everywhere. You see, the devil, he is the, he is the master of division. He is doing everything. Listen up. He's doing everything he can to turn us against God and turn us against each other. He is just as he did here in this instance where these people are beginning to wake up spiritually and see that Jesus, hey, wait a minute, is he really truly the Messiah? Nobody else could do this. And as soon as they did, they tried to, they tried to blow that flame out as hard as they could. And I'm going to tell you, in America, the devil, he sees that the flame is flickering, the flame of liberty, the flame of... I mean, when on college campuses, people are, 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 are basically saying they don't want freedom of speech anymore. Unless it's their speech, nobody else's, just our opinion, not anybody else's. This nation is doomed. We're swirling the toilet bowl and heading down the drain. This thing, I mean, you might as well stick a fork in America. She's done. Unless God intervenes. Because this nation is so divided. We've got to pray for our country, people. We've got to pray for our nation. We've got to pray for healing in our nation. Listen, I, I'm going to tell you right now, that flag, I, 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 I'll stand and I'll salute it and everything. It doesn't hold a higher regard in my mind than the cross of Calvary. I'll throw that thing aside for the cross of Calvary. I'm a Christian above everything else. But I was born here. And, and I have people who died for what liberty we have. And that liberty that we have allows me to hold this book in my hand and preach this truth. And because of that, not because that I think my country is greater than some other country because I'm white or because I, I have a European ancestry, because of this, because I was born in the South, because of it. Listen, I'm not greater than anybody else because of those things. The only thing in me that's any good is that Jesus Christ died for me and saved me, and that's all about me that's any good. Amen? But because God has put me in this great land that is the greatest upon the face of the earth, Maybe she's not as great anymore because of the wickedness in her, but I'm going to tell you, she was founded, the truth she's founded on is greater than any nation has ever been founded upon. And because of that, I have something in my heart that swells when I hear that national anthem because I know it stands for something. It's not just a song written by Francis Scott Key. It stands for something. Amen? That's the stars and stripes. They stand for something. And, and listen, maybe the people of this country don't feel that way anymore. Maybe the people in our government don't feel that way anymore. But it still stands for something. Now, I got all my religion, my, my national 
thing out the way. I just thought I won't say that, amen, because it, it, this nation needs to come back together on what it was founded on, which is freedom, freedom to worship God. Not freedom from God, but freedom to worship God. I read a story last night. Supposedly happened in Tennessee at a football game. Man got on the loudspeaker and he said, and I'm just paraphrasing what he said, but he said, "I would lead us in a word of prayer, but the, but the but because of the Supreme Court, they say that I'm not to do this in a public forum. That same Supreme Court that removed." Prayer out of our schools, the same the same government that 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 allows abortions, the same government. That, I mean, he went down the list of the things that are anti God. He said, "But you people are free to pray as you want to." Now, maybe I don't lead you in it. And one by one, everybody in that stadium bowed their heads and they locked arms and held hands and they called on God. That's the kind of thing we need to come back to in this country. But you see, we've got Pharisees everywhere who are turning the minds of people who don't know God against those who do. All the more need for us to look at those blind people and say to them, you need Jesus, let me take you to Jesus. Now, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. That was my point, wasn't it? And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. You know what I see when I hear house? I think of mamas and daddies who don't love one another the way they ought to. Who don't nurture one another the way they ought to. Who don't care for one another the way they ought to. One wants to do things their way, and the other wants to do things their way. And we're to be one flesh when we're married. The Bible says, they too shall become one flesh. But when you've got, and listen, God set it up for a daddy to be the head of the family and the wife to follow the husband and the children to follow mom and dad. That's the way God set it up, not the way man set it up. It doesn't make me chauvinist. It doesn't make me uh, misogynist or sexist or whatever those words are. It makes me a follower of the Lord to want to do it His way. But you see, in this today, today what, what are we taught? We're taught men and women are equal, and so nobody should do anything, lead anybody else. We ought to all be. And listen, God, God put leaders in a place for a reason, and men are supposed to stand up and be leaders. Amen. I didn't think I was going to get off on this, but I think I will just for a second. Men are to be leaders. Hear me, boys. When you grow up, you're to be leaders. You're Listen, you're not just a lead and saying, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. That's not what we're talking about, being a leader. A leader is someone who does the right thing and others follow them. Amen? Somebody told me a long time ago, you cannot be a good leader until you know how to be a good follower. You can never, and hear me, every one of you, you can never lead anybody until you learn to follow Jesus. But you begin to follow Jesus, then you have become an example for others to follow. Every single daddy in the world needs to hit his knees and ask God humbly to help him to walk in such a way that others want to follow. Amen? And every mother ought to follow because it honors God. It honors God. That's why. It's not because that man's perfect because they'll never be perfect. Amen. They ain't a, there was one perfect man walked this earth. The rest of us need him. Amen. And I didn't I didn't mean to get into the husband and wife thing, but I'm just gonna say it. Listen. Some wives may say, well, my husband, he, he don't do right. And he, listen, you follow, you follow him as long as he follows God. Amen. He may, listen, he tried to lead you out, of, he tried to lead you in such a way 
that you, that causes you to dishonor God, then you, I, I would say you need to follow God in that instance. And you need to show him in the Bible why you are. <clears throat> but I'm not going to get all off into that today. But the Bible says a house divided against itself, it shall not stand. That's God saying that. So you know what that would tell me? Husbands and wives ought to tremble before God. They ought to say, if we don't do this God's way, our marriage ain't going to last. If we don't do things God's way, our children aren't going to turn out right. Jesus wasn't just bumping his gums when he said these things. He's telling us because it's true. And he goes on and he says, and if Satan, speaking of what he did, and speaking of, uh, of that scenario right there, he said, and if Satan cast out Satan, because they accused him of doing it by the power of Satan, he said, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? If the devil looks over and says, oh, there's some things I'm doing, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attack the things I'm doing, well, he's going to shut himself down. That's what Jesus says. That I can't be working by the power of Satan, attacking the power of Satan. That don't make a bit of sense. Y'all with me? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, he said, well, by whom do your children cast them out? <laughs> Is that how y'all do it? Amen. Jesus called them out, folks. Jesus will call them out. Amen. Jesus wasn't no tiptoe through the tulips kind of guy. He was a lay it right out on the line where you can see it. He said, but, look here, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, and I want to, I, wanna, I, wanna, I like what he said over here in, in Luke. It's the, same, it's the same story, but it's in Luke 11, if you don't turn over with me. I, when he goes to talking about casting out devils, I just like the way it reads over here a little differently. <coughs> Luke 11. Verse 20 through 22. Luke 11, 20 through 22. He said, in, he said in the passage we were just reading, he said, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. But he elaborates a little bit over here. Jesus said in verse 20, he said, but if I, with the finger of God, I like that. Amen, don't miss that. The finger of God. I've heard people call a F5 tornado the finger of God. He was able to just wipe things completely away. But I like what Jesus said. If I, by the, with the finger of God, cast out devils. You know, when God says something, it's gone. When God says something, it is. When God speaks, power happens. Amen? If I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. When you got saved, the finger of God touched your soul. When you got saved, the devil, when the finger of God touched you, the devil had to leave. You understand? That same finger of God resides within our bosoms. If we by faith would walk with Jesus Christ, if we by faith would look for people to help, for people to have compassion on, God by His power, by His finger would touch lives. And open blind eyes. It's not us. It's never us. It's us working, speaking the word of God, speaking the truth in love. God works with that. God reaches out and touches them. He said, but if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Verse 21, he says, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me... So we'll turn back over there to where we were. So verse 28 in Matthew 12. If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Listen. I'm trying to say to you that God has showed up here today. God has shown up here today and has kicked the devil out. 
That's what Jesus is trying to say. Don't listen to these people who are trying to smear my name. Don't you listen to them because they're liars. The devil can't kick the devil out. It's only God who's able to do that. But look at the power he has. Look at the authority he has to just make it go. God has the power to change a man just like that. God has the power to take away the desire to sin just like that. Now, mind you, listen to me. He doesn't take away the capacity to sin. All of us are are able. There have been many a great Christian who fell into grave sin. Don't think for one second that it can't happen. But I can tell you this. When a Christian falls into a grave sin, that Christian mourns over what he's done. That believer says, oh, I shouldn't have done that. There's a, there's a, a weight of guilt that goes behind it that was never there before, before God came in. There was never any shame with it before. But now, guilt and shame because we've sinned against our God. <coughs> he that is not with me is against me. Don't you miss that. Can I ask you something? Are you walking with God? Don't answer me out loud, but I want you to honestly answer that question in your own mind and heart. Are you today walking with God Almighty? Are you getting up in the morning and talking to Him and and asking Him, imploring Him for His help throughout the day? Are you, as you come in contact with other people, are you careful in the way that you speak and the things that you do because you want to honor God who lives in you? Are you looking for opportunities to encourage other people through God's power and through God's Word? Is He with you? Are you working with Him or are you against Him? So I'm not, I'm not against God. I've heard people say, I'm not against God, but you're not for Him either. Somebody asked this question one time. said, what in the world are you doing for heaven's sake? Think about that statement. What in the world are you doing for heaven's sake? Can I ask you something? Do you spend your time complaining? Just griping? About everything that's wrong? Or do you ever spend any time trying to do anything to fix it? I mean, anybody can curse the darkness. Smart man lights a candle. Amen. That's what I see people doing. They they sit around cursing the darkness all the time. But nobody's trying to make it light. Nobody's trying to. Nobody's trying to turn the light on. Nobody's trying to. Nobody's trying to show Jesus to this dark world. Nobody's trying to say, "Hey, He's the light. He is the light of the world. If you look to Him, you won't be in darkness anymore." These, these Pharisees were saying, he's darkness, he's dark. And he said, how, how, then how's the light coming up? And then how's the light show up? Now listen to this very carefully. He said, he that is not with me is against me. Oh, I don't want to be against the Lord. I don't ever want to be found to be against God. But you know what? If I'm honest with myself, There's times where I get selfish. There's times where I I get self-indulgent. And and, and God is not in my thoughts. I'm in my thoughts. And there's times when I find myself against him. I'm just going to say it, because listen to me, everyone in here needs to understand that we're all guilty of the same sin. We need to understand that. That needs to drive us to God's throne and say, God, forgive me for being that way. Lord, please help me not to be that way anymore. I don't want to be that way. I don't want to be against you. Now listen to this. This will scare the daylights out of you really listen to it. Verse 31, he said, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy, all manner of sin and blasphemy, shall be forgiven unto men, but 
the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. <coughs> Jesus <coughs> told them straight up. These Pharisees were in grave, grave trouble. <laughs> Looking at what God is doing in Jesus Christ, his son. Looking at what he was doing and the power of God, which was the power of the Holy Ghost, working in Jesus and calling that the work of the devil was blaspheming the Holy Ghost of God. And Jesus said in no uncertain terms, you blaspheme, which is to disparage, which is to run down, tear down, try to destroy the Holy Ghost of God from doing his work and calling it Satan's work. God said, I'll never forgive that. I'll never forgive that. Folks, that ought to scare somebody. Listen, I don't, I, I don't believe for one second a believer can ever commit the unpardonable sin. Amen? And I'll tell you why I don't believe that. Because the Bible tells us that, that listen, once we're in Jesus' hand, we ain't coming out. Nobody, nothing shall pluck us out of his hand. Amen? When the Spirit of God truly lives inside somebody, when someone truly gets saved, there is no way they're going to turn against the one who saved them. There's no way they're going to turn against the Holy Ghost of God who lives in them and call him a devil. That ain't going to happen. Amen? We're sealed by that Holy Spirit, that Holy Ghost, until the day of redemption. That's until the day that Jesus comes and takes us out of this world. But I want to tell you something today. There are people on every channel talking against God's Holy Ghost. There are people in every news magazine all over the Internet, all throughout the world of entertainment, and media, sports, music, and they all speak against the Holy Ghost of God and His working, and they're all going to split hell wide open, and they're going to burn forever and ever and ever in flames of fire and torment. Folks, we ought to be burdened about those who are being influenced, those who are being lured away down into Satan's hell. You need to pull them out of the fire. Tell them they need Jesus. They're blind. They cannot see that Jesus Christ died for their sins. I think of that little girl I witnessed to in that drive through uh, two weeks ago, and uh, she 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 was she she looked so sad, she looked so depressed, she looked so down. She you could look at her and tell that she was she loved darkness. She embraced that darkness. And when I told her and pleaded with her and told her that Jesus died for her, and that He loves her, God loves her. The look of of just confusion and panic hit her face. She's been lied to. She's been lied to all her life. As long as she's been off into this darkness, staring off into this darkness, this darkness has consumed her to her very soul. And now the light came on in that drive through The light, not because of me, but because God impressed it upon my heart and said, Son, you've got to say something to this girl. God's the one that said it. I can tell you right now, Brandon Teague in his natural flesh, Wanted his sandwich and his Coke and get out that drive through I didn't want to say nothing to anybody. I didn't want to cause a commotion. In my natural self, that's all I want to do is go eat lunch. But God said to me, you need to talk to her. You need to tell her. Somebody needs to tell her that, no, no, not somebody. You need to tell her that I love her and that I died for her. You need to tell her that. Folks, there are people in your way. There are people... On, on the way to your lunch. There are people on the way to your grocery getting. There are people on the way to your picking up laundry or whatever you got to do. There are people on the way of what you're doing who are blind. And they need Jesus. They can't see except you take, look here, 
every single one of us that say we have the light of God inside of us. You know, we talked about a city on a hill. Can't be hid. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Folks, that's what a lot of us do. We got it under a bushel. We don't tell nobody. Well, nobody knows we saved because we don't talk about it. We need to lift the lid and say, hey, let me tell you about who lives in me. Let me test. Let me show you. Let me show you what's the, Let me get the darkness out of your life and let me show you your sin. God will light it up and show it for you. And you see that he's your only hope. That's why we're here. Either make, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. See, there ain't no middle ground. <clears throat> There's not no, you can't walk the fence. You're either one or the other. You can't. See, people want to try to walk somewhere between the world and God, and you can't do that. It's either a good tree or it's a bad tree, right? Either it's producing something that's good and it's going to help others, or it's producing something that's bad and it's going to make others sick. It's either corrupt or it's a good tree. And he said the tree is known by its fruit. The tree is known by what it produces. It's that stuff hanging out there at the end. The fruit of your life. I want to ask you this morning, what is the fruit of your life? The people who know you, the people who come in contact with you, do they know you by your bad fruit? Can I say this? I, I mean, I will say it. I can. I'm the one preaching. Amen. I had a lot of bad fruit for a long time until I let God have control. What little I might have produced out there on the end didn't amount to anything because I wasn't letting God have the power of my life. But you see, when I when I turned it over to him, God showed me there were people all around me who needed him all the time, and I didn't see it because I wasn't I was being selfish with me. I wasn't I wasn't living for God. Not like I should. I had to grow. I had to understand just exactly what God wanted me to do with this life. You see, I didn't know what to do with this life. But now that I understood, I, because I'm his, I have a purpose. And God has a plan. You see, he is the light of the world. He is the power of, of God. And he does live in me. And there are people outside of me that need him. And they're around me. And God wants me to talk to them about him. He doesn't want me to do it in my wisdom. He doesn't want me to do it in my words. He wants me to do it in his. And that's why I have this book. And that's why I have the power of God living inside of me. Every Christian has the same power available to them. Every Christian has the same promises made to them. Jesus addressed these who came against him, and here's what he did. He called them a bunch of snakes. Old oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? He said, how, you religious. You're the religious crowd. You're the ones people go down to the temple and talk to. How in the world can you say anything good? You're a bunch of snakes. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. <coughs> Ain't nobody going to go to a septic tank and let down a bucket for a, a draw to get a drink, are they? <laughs> You're not going to find good things in an evil man's heart. A man can try all he wants to to be religious, but he'll never have anything good in him but poison until he comes to Christ and lays it all down and asks God to be his all in all, ask Christ to forgive his sins and be his Savior, that man can't ever have anything good in him. But once God lives inside him, he becomes a well bringing up water into eternal life. And listen, all we have to do is take that water which is coming out of us if we're a child of God and we're walking with him and just take it and let it splash on those who we come in contact with. And it comes from God. It doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from religion. It comes from the force. It comes from the, the river of life. It comes from, it comes from the, the crystal flowing river of God. I 
a good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things, verse 35 says. What's in your heart? They ask all the time on TV, what's in your wallet? Well, what's in your heart? What is in your heart? And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. See, ain't no middle ground. There's no lukewarmness. It's just good or evil. But I say unto you that every idle word, don't you miss this, every idle word that men speak shall speak, shall they give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. <coughs> you see, <coughs> them lost folks who claim to speak for God, there's going to come a day where they're going to have to come into God's throne room and they're going to have to get down on their knees before God and he's going to pronounce judgment upon them while they kneel before him. And when it's all said and done and the judgment has been read and they've been judged to be the enemy of God, lost, dead in their sins, They'll have to sit there and they'll have to, on their knees, they'll have to proclaim that you are King of kings and you are Lord of lords. And they'll have to give glory to him once and for all before they're picked up by the angels, taken over to the edge and pitched into the lake of fire and brimstone for all eternity. Their words, their own words will condemn them. You know what? The Bible says by their words they should be justified. Listen. I have believed upon the name of the only begotten Son of God. And because of that, I tell others that they need to believe on the only, name of the only begotten Son of God. I have been saved by His grace. I have to tell others that, I, that they need to be saved by His grace. I need to tell others what He said to me. And by, by those words, those are the words that God will bring before me. And if He says anything about, well done, thou good and faithful servant, it won't be the words that I used of my on doing out of my own brain. It'll be the words that I shared to others that came out of His holy word. So I urge you this morning, understand that the devil is, he. oh yeah, he's doing his work today. But God is more powerful. And we need to turn our hearts to God. Like that song said that we sang earlier, <clears throat> revive us again. Revive us. Well, you know, when somebody needs reviving, that means they're almost dead. They're, they're almost down for the count, and they need, they need reviving. They need to be brought back to their living condition. Folks, we're living in a day of apostasy. We're living in a day where, where, where most people who claim to have been followers of God, they're, they're, they've torn down all the things that they believed in. The major denominations of this country have all seemingly fallen by the wayside. It's just small pockets of believers anymore that believe anything. We have got to turn our eyes upon Jesus. We have got to put everything we have in his word, and we've got to hold his hand and walk with him to the finish line. And all the way while we're walking with him, holding his hand as dear children, we need to be looking to those who don't know him and saying, listen, come and go with me. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Let's go together. Come and go with me. Look to him and live. Folks, you and I have been left here to do just that. They're blind. They can't speak the truth because they don't know the truth. They're blind. They can't see the light. Let's turn them to it. Let's tell them about Christ. I don't, I don't, listen, there's people out there listening to us right now, listen to the sound of my voice, and they're just as lost as they can be. They, they, they've been wandering in sin for so long, and I hope and I pray that they've heard the truth this morning. And I hope and I pray that they'll turn to Christ and they'll believe on him and be saved, just like you and I did at one time. I pray for, for anybody that's here this morning that ain't saved yet that they come to realize that they're going to have to be saved too. <laughs> oh, uh, there's so many people around us that need Jesus. So many who are lost. 
we need to be a light and we go out of this world into this world. Right here is a good place. We come together and we worship God and we love Him and we praise Him and we know that we're His. But you watch, you watched that fellow come in earlier and he sat down. He thought he was coming in to get a bite to eat. And he sat down. He could have just sat there and listened just as easy as could be. But you know what? He didn't want a part of what we were doing. I don't know. I'm not judging him. I don't know him. But I know he, he looked like he touched the electric fence. He's ready to get out of here. <clears throat> Folks, people need God. They need him. And you and I carry him everywhere we go. Let's fire his prayer. Father in heaven, please help us this, this day. Lord God, I pray, Father, for those, Lord, who are, who are among us, Lord, and we've, 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 just, we've just lived for us so long that we've kind of gotten a habit of living for us. Oh, Lord, we're backslidden in our hearts. We're cold in our hearts. Father, I pray you forgive us. Lord, revive us again, as the song said. We need you to wake us up, to arise, to help us arise from our slumber and our deadened condition. Oh, Holy Ghost of God, stir in our bosom again. Trouble us over the sin in our life. Teach us, according to the Word of God, how to walk in such a manner that we're pleasing in the Lord's sight because we're walking in the steps of Jesus. Lord, help us to realize that we are in a dark world. But, Lord, we have the light of the world with us. Father, please use us. Be merciful to souls out there today that are lost and in sin and on their way to hell. Oh, God, I pray that you convict them. Oh, God, I pray that you show them Jesus can wash their sins away with his blood. He can make them as white as snow, clean, forgiven, saved, and a child of God. Oh, if they'd turn to him, if they'd repent, if they'd, if they'd throw their self on your mercy. God, I plead with you. Please save souls today. Please, Lord, restore backslidden hearts. Lord, please teach us to walk in your word. Father, I pray that, Lord, you do a work in our midst today. We thank you, and we give you glory, and we give you praise for all these things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.